Right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Greetings to everyone. Uh, and welcome to the eighth co-op colloquium uh, organized by the ICA Asia Pacific Committee on Cooperative Research uh, in close collaboration with the, uh, uni the Griffith University and the Griffith Center for Systems Innovation in this iteration. Uh, we have uh, received some uh, unprecedented interest uh, while we circulated uh, about the colloquium in our website and social media. So uh, we, are, we are back here and probably the last co-op colloquium of this year, uh, the eighth version, of course, uh, with some very interesting discussions lined up around uh, co-op colloquium on uh, cooperatives and systems innovation. And of course, our, uh, our lead participants here, Dr. Ingrid Borkett, who is a director of the Griffith Center for Systems Innovation, and of course, Dr. Sitzel Grimstad, a senior lecturer at the center, will be uh, leading us through the presentations for, uh, for this session. Uh, before that, uh, may I uh, also take this opportunity to introduce the group to Dr. Yashwant Dongre, chairperson of the Committee on Cooperative Research in ICA Asia Pacific, and I'll request him to please uh, share his welcome remarks to the group and the uh, community here before we uh, start the discussions. Over to you, Dr. Dongre. Thank you, Mohit. Very good morning and uh, good day to all of you. And as uh, Mohit said, uh, uh, this is the last of the series of colloquium for this year. Uh, we are doing it on uh, every quarter. So this is the fourth colloquium uh, for this year. We started this uh, uh, kind of an academic exchange uh, through this webinar, uh, our colloquium series last year. And uh, uh, this is the second year in succession and we have been quite regularly doing it. And some very good discussions have happened and some very innovative uh, themes had come. In fact, uh, one such very innovative uh, uh, colloquium we had, uh, the one uh, before the last one also was from Australia, from uh, the team from Monash University, where we had a very interesting uh, discussion. So uh, that also makes us believe that today we are going to have one more such interesting thing. And the theme, I think, is very, very important when we talk about uh, systems innovation. And there is a dedicated center, and I'm sure relating it to the cooperative context is something that is very much needed today. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I would take this opportunity to welcome uh, Professor Ingrid Burkett, uh, representing uh, Griffith University. Uh, of course, thank you very much for agreeing uh, to be here and uh, warm welcome to you on behalf of the research committee. Uh, to uh, Sitzel Grimshed, of course, maybe today she is also part of the team from Griffith, but uh, she is our own uh, committee vice chair. I also found out another vice chair, Dr. Kim, also has joined. Um, and I welcome uh, Balu, uh, Regional Director of International Cooperative Alliance Asia Pacific. He has been uh, one of those who is, I think, instrumental in making all the committees active. And uh, so thank you, Balu, for joining uh, in the night of Sunday. And all of you, uh, I now see that uh, the number is increasing. So all those who have joined this, a very warm welcome to you. And uh, I, I request all of you not only to be the listeners, but uh, participate in the discussion. And maybe some of you would then become our resource person for our next series of uh, colloquium <laughs> that start after January. So once again, a warm welcome to all of you. And I'm looking forward to a great time today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dongri, for uh, setting the context uh, and indeed uh... A warm welcome to all participants here, uh, joining us from uh, around the regions, uh, not only the Asia Pacific, but beyond. So uh, with this, we are ready to start discussions around the topic. And uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sitzel Grimstad and uh, Dr. Ingrid Burkett from the Griffith Center uh, for Systems Innovation to please uh, uh, share their uh, views and insights on this very interesting topic. Over to you, Dr. Grimstad. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mohit. Um, I will try to share my screen first. Um, uh, 
I hope you are seeing this. Yes, we can see it now. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's all good. <laughs> I might be looking a bit on the side because I'm uh, looking at an, a second screen. Um, but we want to uh, we wanted to present a colloquium on um, the role of cooperatives in systems innovation, and this is in a way a new uh, thinking process for us at the um, Center for Systems Innovation, and it's uh, so I would call it a uh, what should I say a um, a work in development. But so what, uh, and we were, Ingrid and I, we will split this presentation in two. So I will start up the presentation with a bit of background. Um, and let me see, um, two, 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 sorry. No, wait. Ah, here we go. Okay, um, first, <clears throat> a bit of background on the global challenges and complexities and why these demand new solutions and especially systems innovation. And then we wanted to link that up to what makes cooperatives different when we are confronting with this changing face of the innovation. Um, then I'll hand over the word to Ingrid, who will um, tell we should say develop what what we mean by systems innovation and also how may, how cooperatives may contribute particularly in this um, process and then I will end um, this presentation by kind of a few thoughts uh, of about uh, looking ahead what what we want to um, maybe some uh, points that we should have in mind when we're looking ahead. So, first of all, we think that from our center, we think that um, uh, innovation is increasingly critical. We've just been through a period of a global pandemic, um, and it has kind of confronted us with a lot of almost um, existential questions. Um, about innovation. First of all, we saw innovation at a very high stage. We saw COVID vaccines being developed. We saw, you know, um, society, uh, countries shutting down, locking down, masks being developed and so on. So we saw an, an exponential level of innovation. And yet we also, it also kind of touched us uh, in our core because and um, many businesses, many organizations said, oh, are we really ready for these big, complex, global issues that we are confronted with? Are we really um, able to pivot and innovate as fast as we need to do in order to deal with sustainable development goals, the global climate change, degradation and environment? Are we able to deal with the technological shifts that we see that we are confronted with. There's also a big question mark around the current way um, business, global business is conducted, uh, how um, we are seeing and, and their social license to operate. We see more and more, uh, um, especially young people are very um, skeptical towards the big the big corp global corporations and how they operate. So we can see that um, the world is faced with a lot of global, um, what should I say, uh, uh, a lot of global challenges that we need to um, have a confront. <clears throat> so I wanted you wanted us to look back a bit uh, in what. Um, in a, in systems that we see happens when technological changes happen. And we'll go back all the way to the first industrial revolution. Um, because what we when we think about innovation, we think that it's technology. It, it, innovation equals technology. But it is a lot more complex. And this slide or this image um, really, I think, highlights a lot of the invisible innovation that happens 
when we see large technological changes happening in society. Um, and if we see the first and the second industrial revolutions that happened in Britain in the uh, 17th century, first the industrialization and then the age of the steam. And so those were technological changes, but that, that triggered a whole series and di um, uh, systems and processes of social, institutional and economic changes. And because we saw, because of the industrialization, we saw mass migration into urban centers. That again triggered changes in food supply issues. We saw um, the shift from work from home to factory work. That changes family structures. So we saw social changes. We saw institutional changes because we suddenly had a rural, uh, we had both rural and urban poverty, which led to advocacy and um, uh, uh, processes of rights, giving um, the working classes more rights. And that's when we also saw, saw the growth of mutual aid, cooperatives, voluntary philanthropy, and so on. And the need for capital was also very prominent in this time. And we saw a boom in capital markets. We saw a middle class burgeoning, and which again led to demand for reforms. We need people wanted to be able to vote. They wanted to every voice, um, every class in society wanted to have a say in how society developed. I would like to see a similar slide for today. I don't have that. <laughs> But I think this illustrates really well how there's a lot of invisible innovation, social, institutional, economic, and, and um, processes that are happening while we kind of are blinded a little bit by the technological innovation happening in society. So, <clears throat> but this, these technological changes that is happening at an exponential rate, as you can see in this figure, um, it, this is happening at an ever faster pace. And while and, and technological change in a fast pace is kind of uh, a positive because it means that technology will be cheaper, uh, decreasing in price, so making it more accessible to more people. However, when we look at institutional change, social change, that happens at a much slower rate because we are people, we are maybe resistant a bit to change. And so, and organizations need a whole process, a social process to change. Cultures need longer time to change. And yet, when we look at the need of change to avert these big global challenges that we have, um, that is, is what we can call the urgent innovation space. It's the space where we need to, to innovate both social, institutional, economic, uh, and so forth. And it is in this space between, um, uh, between the, what should I say, the rate of institutional change and the rate of change needed to avert the crisis that we need to see the role of cooperatives and mutuals. How we as cooperative and mutual organizations or uh, individuals, how are we able to have a role in um, changing the relationship and changing the rate of change so that we can uh, meet these global challenges? Um, <clears throat> I want to jump forward because this is uh, some research that Carlotta Perez has done on the different uh, stages, uh, the different um, different types, uh, the different um, industrial revolutions or big technological changes. And if we go down to the fifth um, uh, industrial revolution, the ICT revolution, we can see that she she has suggested that we between each kind of, there's a crisis point, a turning point between one um, technology 
going into another uh, um, big technology. And that crisis point or that turning point is kind of where we are at the moment. Um, it says 2008 to 2000 question mark. I think this crisis point was accentuated by COVID because that really made this crisis point or this turning point even longer. And <clears throat> if we we look back at the different industrial changes that we've had, you can see that there is a crisis point and then there's a, a in a way, a, um, a positive global era, era coming after. So maybe that's too hopeful, but there's also, I think, um, a lot of movement uh, because of the possibilities of technology um, and the pressure to um, be more distributive and more collaborative across uh, organizations and, um, and countries. I have to be quick so I don't take all the time from Ingrid. <laughs> um, but so we, so, with this kind of in mind, the big picture in mind, we see that there is a, a changing face of innovation from purely technology focus towards more about service, about process, business models, organizations. So it's not only about one product, it's about a lot more. It's about how you deliver this product and with what uh, or process and um, or service, service or product and, and the process surrounding that. And what are the business model? Is it one big global company um, maximizing their, um, their profit or is do we have other business models where we distribute wealth a bit better? Also, we see that innovation is changing from primarily entrepreneurship, so the individual, to more a focus on business models um, and how we uh, can develop business model that can benefit more, both the customers, both the, the employees. And of course, I would say also uh, members in co-ops. Uh, and then the last element in the changing face of innovation is that we are looking at from growth as the growing the business from as, as the main focus to much more a focus on the impact or the ultimate purpose of innovation. So what, why are we innovating? Are we innovating only to earn more money or are we actually innovating to both have a sustainable business, but also to contribute our part in solving some of these big uh, global challenges. And I think, this is what our center is very much focused on, Ingrid, I think. And uh, um, the innovation for impact will be more and more important. So, and this, we talk about that in our center as directional innovation. So it's not any kind of innovation, but it's innovation to solve, to be a part of a, um, a bigger solution. So we talk about holistic value creation, we talk about impact through growing the well-being of people, place, and planet. So not only uh, economic uh, growth, but the well-being of um, people, place, and planet. Um, and so Wayne Visser, he talks about five pathways to innovation. And they should, that innovation should be sustainable. So it is durable, renewable, and abundant. It's, um, innovation should be satisfying so that solutions make us healthy, happy, and valued. And they should be secure, solutions that make us more protected, resilient, and adaptive. So adapt. these are all really important when we are faced with these global challenges. Um, Innovations need to be smart, smart in the way that it connects us better to each other uh, and responsive to the challenges. Maybe agile would also be a good word for that. Um, we need to have um, innovation that can be agile when we are 
as we see the, the world and technology is changing so fast. And then the last one, which is very much, I think, uh, at the heart of the cooperative and mutual movement is that innovations need to be shared. Solutions that make us more inclusive, that provides more fairness in the solutions and efficient. So we don't unnecessarily use a lot of resources for limited impact. So I think these are models that are really important for us to have in mind. Um, when we talk about co-op's role in systems innovation. And, <clears throat> you know, co-ops have a unique characteristics based on uh, and, and that make them potentially a very powerful actors in systems innovation. Because of the cooperative values and identity, they are very much uh, built on self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. Most of us cooperatives know this almost by heart, <laughs> but, but it is this kind of um, a resilience in the way cooperatives um, see themselves, I guess, in, in the world that is, can be a very powerful model going forward. The cooperative principles are also very much about um, um, democratic um, participation in decision making, having a voice. Um, it is also a lot about um, autonomy and independence, being part, uh, um, both contributing, but also being um, uh, autonomous in the sense that um, if there is a solution that provides good local or regional solutions, then we should maintain that autonomy and independence to progress these solutions. I think very importantly, um, the principles of education, training and information needs to just be strengthened. Um, and last, the cooperation among cooperatives. There, the cooperative and mutual sector has a clear benefit because this cooperation among cooperatives is so um, vital to extend and uh, have, what should I say, genuine cooperation and sharing ideas and sharing solutions. And then the last one, of course, concern for community, which, which is uh, about um, protecting and bringing solutions into not only the members, but the community that uh, they are part of. And now I think I will uh, hand over the, the floor to Ingrid. And you just give me a sign and I will change the slide. Is that okay? Okay, great. Um, I'll, I'll zoom through them so that we've got enough time for um, discussion. Yeah. Um, so just starting with uh, the what do we actually mean by systems innovation? And I want to go back in, in history, at least in Western history. So a lot of what we've talked about so far, obviously, is a very Western interpretation of innovation um, that has, you know, is not universally applicable, but um, that's where the um, the majority of the literature comes from. So it it's fantastic to see how innovation is now shaping around much more diverse um, ways of seeing the world and 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 theories. Um, but if we have a look at Western history of innovation, it's it's mostly been focused on individual innovators and the power of innovation as being the entrepreneur. Um, that's growth driven and individual profit. So when we think about systems innovation, we want to flip that um, to really a focus that is on collective challenges that face us all and collective um, benefits. So how can we distribute the benefits of innovation more clearly? Um, and the systems part of it, I mean, systems... We all live in systems, right from the family, right through to, you know, economic systems. They're really just a framework to make sense of the world that is relational. Um, and that's the way that we use it. So we're interested not just in singular entities, but relationships between entities that make up systems. 
And for us, innovation is not necessarily what's new, it's what's better, what creates better outcomes for people, for communities and for the planet as a whole. Okay, Cecil. Um, so if we're thinking about our framework for systems innovation, we're interested in the very grand challenges um, and, you know, for a planet as a whole, we don't need to uh, labour that we have a lot of uh, challenges ahead of us and that we're currently facing on many, many fronts. But what we're interested in in systems innovation is to have really a bold approach. Now, you can go planet, but you can also see how these can be translated into really small systems, community systems, neighbourhoods, um, even families, if you if you dare. Um, it's about being intentional about how we use different levers. Um, it's about rethinking some of the fundamentals. So, you know, if you follow us, you'll see that we're, we're grappling with what are some of the underlying fundamentals that we need to change? For example, risk profiles and our understanding of risk. It's about how do we draw together actors and stakeholders and build collective intelligences to, um, to, to challenge and to create innovations that go beyond individual entrepreneurs. And it's about trying to connect up um, portfolios of learnings that help us to ha deal with the scale that we need to innovate at. Okay, so this all. <clears throat> You won't be able to read this slide, and I apologise. Um, you can. We will send around these slides, and um, you can also find this. But this is really just um, a a representation of all the ways that this has been translated into enterprises, so businesses, and I think even in in the impact enterprise space, we haven't gone far enough in the majority of impact enterprises, say in social enterprises to really look at the collectivization of benefit. And that's where I see such a huge potential for bringing in cooperatives much more clearly into the way that we understand the future of business and even the future of impact enterprises. There's plenty more room to build a collective mindset in business. Okay, so it's all. Um, we also think that it is important to start to seed some um, collective and cooperative innovations across more than, you know, when we think about innovation, we often think about the far future. Um, we think of innovation on three horizons and probably actually even five. So what can we learn from the, the distant past and from you know, the, the way that traditions have influenced where we are now. And if, you know, we're really clear in Australia and you know, growingly around the world that we need to learn from first people's knowledge. Um, we see that as, as innovative as, you know, what's coming up uh, in the third horizon or the distant future. And so the way that we work um, in systems innovation and the potential for more collective mindsets is what seeds can we plant now at all of those horizons that could help us find the next step forward. So rather than thinking about the far distant future, let's start with the seeds that we can nurture right now to, to think about how we build different kinds of systems. Okay, so that's all. Um, just an example to ground that, um, we're involved with uh, a partner organisation called Ethical Fields in thinking about how um, we could build different kinds of wealth structures in local communities, drawing on the work that's happened both um, in the UK and the US, but in lots and lots of other places around the world around community wealth building where you know we're trying to re reground um, the the monetary and economic system that has you know um, created all of these really tricky crises that we now face into much more one that where people actually matter, where the environment matters, where local ownership matters, where democratic participation matters. Um, 
currently cooperatives form a part of community wealth building, but we'd like to emphasize the the um, innovation that is possible if they became, you know, if we could help community wealth builders really understand the power of cooperatives as a core part of this way of innovating our futures by going back into back to the future, really. Um, okay, Cecil. Um, the other thing that I think is is really interesting, so much of the innovation in, around the world now is talking about, okay, well, how do we scale these things? Um, and, you know, we can, there's so much to learn from cooperatives around scaling. Um, and it's not just about the sort of scaling big, which we mostly hear in the innovation space, or even the scaling out, which is the other big one, but to really look at the scaling up and scaling deep, which I think cooperatives have been remarkably successful at. So how can we learn from the successes of cooperatives around scaling up and deep to really influence the sometimes quite perverse discussions that happen around scaling in the innovation space, particularly when it comes to um, how do we make sure that, you know, we are privileging equity and equality, that we are thinking about how the benefits flow and distribute across different um, populations, and how do we, you know, um, put forward a, a just economy. Um, I think uh, one way that we're exploring this too is to take a different perspective on the way that capital flows. So this is um, a piece that we have imagined for our federal treasurer, who happens to be our local member as well, um, where we could argue that instead of just having an investment system that um, privileges profit for the few, we could start to imagine not just distributing the capital and the benefits of that capital, but interlinking different parts of systems so that actually create multipliers that can then multiply the possibilities for equity and equality. So, you know, um, increasingly CISL's leading a lot of work around um, housing and cooperative housing, but how can we link that to, you know, um, the ownership of development infrastructure? How can we link it to enterprises that could help us to build and retrofit um, existing housing to cope with uh, climate change? How could we generate local jobs that actually where the wealth stays in place and, you know, builds uh, local businesses? And how can we link that over to green energy? So it's really a different way of collectivising the the um, inputs into the the capital system, but then also sharing the benefits across um, communities and and systems. And last slide, um, you've got an example, and I'll hand back over to you. Yes, so this is an example from uh, Zurich, uh, um, where. Um, there's uh, a substantial um, sector of housing cooperatives, affordable house housing cooperatives. And um, uh, some researchers have developed what they call um, the Zurich model of financing affordable housing. And as you can see, um, um, to the right two columns there, there's a big mix of different contributors into um, the, the capital needed to build um, the cooperative, uh, affordable cooperative housing system in Zurich. So it's both member shares. It's also solidarity funds, so some kind of crowdfunding. There's revolving funds, so some um, cooperatives have actually joined together and developed a big investment fund and they contribute 10% uh, uh, into new projects. Then we have the pension fund, uh, City of Zurich Pension Fund, which is uh, uh, government funds. And then you have, in a way, mainstream um, 
bank, uh, commercial bank funding. And we found when we are trying to look at systems to fund affordable housing in Australia that this there's a lack of this more open, um, there's a lack of solutions in, in blending different types of funding to, to get the outcome that we want, which is affordable housing for a larger part of people who are now basically um, left with either no housing or extremely expensive housing uh, and, and having to rent and change, um, change dwelling every six months. So we are very keen to look at these different models. And I wish we had a model from um, the Asia Pacific <laughs> to, to, to look to. But at the moment, um, this is what we have. But I'm hoping when we are looking ahead, and especially towards um, the year of cooperatives in 2025 that I, I would so much like to, to start looking at how can we develop and showcase systems innovation and, and the diversity perspectives from the Asia Pacific region. How can we um, look at the solutions and how to um, gr grow the solutions or scale the solutions found in many different Asia Pacific countries? and also maybe develop an analytical approach to how cooperatives have had uh, a part in this process. And I have, you know, I have been following the Asia, the ICA Asia Pacific focus um, in recent years. And I think it's been uh, interesting to see how they align themselves more and more with the principles of social and solidarity economy. And maybe that also bodes well for collaboration within a larger network of organizations. So not only co-ops and mutuals, but uh, being part of the larger systems of organizations. And I think, I think that can be really important, but there's, an, um, there's a kind of underlying, um, it's a really important because it provides exchange of ideas, approaches and solutions. But I think one of the underlying um, prerequisite, in a sense, is that we become more conscious and explicit about what the cooperative values and identities brings to the systems. So if we kind of fall back and replicate cor corporate company culture or uh, ways of, of uh, being businesses, I think that's um, that doesn't really progress us forward. We need to actually be very uh, conscious and, and proud of being uh, of what the cooperative model can provide. And I do think that uh, co-ops and mutuals can offer inspiring models, but only if they are aware of and develop a strong foundation as a very different for purpose business and organizational model. And so I think that was my last comment and I hope we can have some questions and discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sitzel and uh, Dr. Ingrid. Uh, indeed, uh, great to hear these perspectives and fresh thinking around the, how, around the way cooperatives and systems innovation can be perceived and especially so with the, within the broader framework of social and solidarity economy in the Asia Pacific. I'm sure there would be uh, some comments, questions, maybe reflections or clarifications to seek uh, from the audience. So uh, feel free uh, to just maybe raise your hand or probably unmute yourself and uh, share your remark. Uh, uh, to begin with, maybe I already see uh, Mr. Anthony McPillan from the Cooperative Bonds uh, has also shared a couple of comments in the chat box. So I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Anthony, you'd like to maybe share more about these comments and uh, your reflections? Um, I wasn't expecting that, uh, but yeah, sure, I can share a little bit. Um, yeah, great presentation. Thank you both. Uh, yeah, look, I think um, as uh, Ingrid sort of highlighted there, that there's been a very long-term sort of agnostic view of organisational form. Um, we see this mirrored by government now with, with funded programs and things like that. Um, as well as within this sort of broader 
um, sometimes pretty beige, bland term. I would agree with that, Ingrid, around social enterprise. Um, and that there's a kind of, at least in Australia, there's a continual sort of mantra around, you know, it doesn't matter how we get there as long as we get the impact. And there's very little discussion of a broader social economy, let alone uh, a social and solidarity economy um, as well. So I think some of the threads that you're drawing together are great, but there's a very quiet resistance, I think, with some parts of the uh, mainstream social enterprise movement to the cooperative form. I think possibly because it's a bit messy. Democracy and inclusivity um, is sometimes not neat, but then innovation isn't particularly neat either. So I think that's, um, I think it's a kind of a top-down approach based on charities, a donor recipient type model that has really infected this social enterprise movement. And I'm not quite sure. There's some great people across the board doing really great things, but it'd be great if we could get a dialogue going where we can just move beyond that a little bit. Yep, couldn't agree more, Anthony. And um, I, you know, full transparency, we wrote the National Strategy for Social Enterprise. Um, we tried really, really, really hard to shift the conversation. But, you know, there is long, long tales of um, connections into um, the welfare state and uh, charity models, as you say, in this whole sector. So it's, you know, I think we've got to lead by demonstration. Um, and I think, you know, we're really, we're really seeing the long-term benefit of cooperative enterprises to shift the fundamentals, not just, you know, here's a social enterprise and a job, here's, um, you know, ownership and democratic participation. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Uh, would there be any comments, clarifications? We do have uh, participants joining from Japan, from PNG, from Ireland, from Indonesia, or uh, even from South Korea. So I'm not sure if there are any questions or any just comments or reflections and perspectives based on the experience in your country. Okay, uh, I think uh, the session is quite clear to the participants. Uh, in which case, uh, can I also then request uh, Mr. Balu Ayer, Regional Director of the ICAAP, uh, based on the uh, practical experiences that we've been uh, having uh, around this topic in the region. Uh, he'd also uh, like to share some remarks and reflections uh, given the presentation. So over to you, Mr. Ayer. Uh, thank you, Mohit, and uh, thank you very much, Professor Ingrid and uh, Dr. Sitzel, for your uh, presentation on uh, cooperatives and systems innovation. Uh, the other day, I was uh, talking to a colleague, and I was mentioning that we are living in VUCA times, and uh, in terms of VUCA for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. But then this person said, no, we are now living in Bani times. Uh, and he said, oh, it's brittle, anxious, nonlinear, incomprehensible. And you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, uh, you talked about COVID-19, climate change, the recent technological thing around artificial intelligence, generative AI, the kind of changes that we are seeing. And what it shows is that our problems are interconnected and multifaceted and uh, it's constantly changing. So how do we, uh, in such a situation, what is the, how do we approach or the, what they say is the traditional approach. You can't take a step-by-step -step approach. You need to be looking at it in a holistic way. And I guess that's what uh, you've been, uh, through your presentations, I've been saying that how do we look at it from a much broader sense, a much more interconnected sense, 
And the important point which you put across is that innovation is not just technology. And that's where much of the uh, attention tends to be focused on. Uh, the, we get carried away by the technology, real, little realizing that it's a tool. We have to use it as a tool to see how we can put it in place. And uh, the fact that you mentioned about uh, invisible innovation, and it's very interesting to see how you took the industrial revolution and brought out these different pieces of innovation which was happening at the social level, at the cultural level. And that's where I think the cooperatives and mutuals, uh, we had the Rochdale pioneers start around that time in terms of uh, looking at the need and innovating. And since then things have uh, progressed. Uh, so for me, I think uh, this has been very uh, interesting presentation in terms of uh, how we look at uh, the role that cooperatives have to play. Uh, important is our identity, how do we preserve our identity along which comes with the values and principles. Uh, but for me, it is more, it's not uh, that it's just enough for us to be saying we are different, but how do we also uh, innovate within? How do we look at the different pieces? And what you mentioned about uh, looking at the flow of capital was very interesting and that it's not just giving credit, but then how do you look at your inter uh, the interaction between the different parts, be it housing, be it culture, and how are we able to connect it becomes very important. So I think that there's a lot which uh, the cooperators themselves need to be doing, seeing in terms of not just while the member attention is important, it's also important to look at what are the other uh, aspects which affect us and how do we uh, respond to that. And for me, that's uh, one of the questions that I had is how do we, uh, it's not uh, one, two questions in fact, how do cooperatives themselves look within and innovate? And two is how, and it's not just in isolation. So how do we bring others into the picture or how do we connect with others? So what has been the experience and how do we uh, go about? Because one of the big challenges for cooperatives is while we within talk about our models and the identity and the way we work, there's very little awareness about uh, how cooperatives are and what we do. So while we need to innovate within, but how do we also engage with the external stakeholders? You mentioned that as the research center, you are able to uh, engage with your lawmaker and get them to see it. So is there something which you've seen in terms of how, uh, wherever you've seen these innovations happen, how has it happened and what has been your experience on that count? You, do you want me to start and you can join in, Cecil? Um, I think that's a fantastic summary. Thank you so much. Um, really captured, um, I think, what we were trying to cover. Um, I, I guess we see cooperatives from two perspectives. One is the, the form of cooperatives and the other is how that form gets translated into mental models and um, way, different ways to look at the world, a worldview, if you like. <laughs> um, and, yes, the form has lots to offer and, you know, I know um, there's some movement around to shift the principles of cooperatives. I'm not sure whether that's the space that we would see the innovation potential more in the in how do those principles get translated into other um into other contexts so at the moment we're um we're looking at ways to govern collaboration when we're trying to deal with really large scale complex issues like addressing the sustainable development goals um, and one of the things that we're really grappling with is how do you govern cooperation um, across really diverse entities? And, you no, know, we just keep coming back to actually cooperatives have done this for a long time. How could we, how could we learn from 
um, the way that you have enacted those principles and look at an adjacent field that could actually learn from those relational practices. Um, so I think that's one. Um, the other thing is while we have really big go goals and visions, we also um, know that we're operating in really complex environments. So we're only always looking for the next best step um, rather than trying to fix everything at once. So, you know, challenging our treasurer is one step. Getting him to actually invest in that model, that's a few steps down the line. <laughs> So I don't want to overclaim what we're doing. We're taking one step at a time. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to add a little bit, and that is one thing that is very important when we when we um, are looking at how to change, create or systems change, uh, and doing uh, innovative experiments or experimenting and testing models of collaboration or or different implementing of different projects and trying to be aware of how do these experiments in collaboration or finding solutions how do they work what what are the lessons learned are they good solutions then we can scale you know like and that's what ingrid was talking about the three horizons we need the next best step is trying testing out a new solution or a new collaborative network to find the solution somewhere. And then if that works, we go on. We don't find that ultimate solution far, far in the future. And I think, um, in, especially in complex systems, experimenting and, and being aware that we are testing and experimenting solutions is uh, quite an important step for for all, um, what should I say, or all, all organizations, but co-ops are quite, are, are especially placed in uh, collaborating, I think. So maybe we can pull together um, different, um, what should I say, partners from different sectors to collaborate on finding solutions and experimenting going forward. And I see that Zurich model as one model that they have developed that has worked, yeah? And we can maybe we can find other ways where we collaborate with you know commercial capital, government capital, other capital, and find ways. But but it's it's driven by this co cooperative spirit and co uh, and and the sixth principle: collaboration among cooperatives. Right. Okay. Thank you uh, very much uh, again, Mr. Ryer, for your uh, summary and the. Uh, remarks and of course uh, Dr. Sitzel and Dr. Ingrid again for the reflections. Indeed, it's 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 a topic of uh, uh, of great interest as we see also in the chat box here. We have some comments uh, from Ireland as well. Uh, how uh, this high level policy uh, making it's indeed uh, and the related uh, you know uh, investment required there is is indeed. Uh, quite interesting and um, has its own challenges and struggles for, for us in the academia. Uh, so with that, uh, we are also very close to the uh, uh, to the end of the session. And I just thought I'd, I'd like to take a, uh, you know, see if there's any other final comments, reflections, or any inputs uh, one would like to share in, in this group. Uh, just a quick uh, question to both Sitzel and Ingrid in terms of, uh, so you said uh, one for, in the Asia-Pacific region, we would definitely be interested to see how we can engage with the center uh, because this is a very important uh, topic and uh, there's a lot of uh, I, interest can be generated. So it'll be good, uh, not today, but uh, way in which we could and uh, especially with the research committee. I think we for me, you need a set of people who are interested in dwelling into the topic. We need cooperatives. We need some engagement. So definitely uh, we should be thinking about how we can at least take, you talked about Australia, there's some work going on. Maybe we could take a couple of other uh, countries and see how we could uh, look into the subject a bit more in detail and come up with what are these types of innovations which are possible and how do we sort of go about it? So what I would like to see is this 
uh, the uh, this being a start but how do we build on this is something which we need to be looking towards indeed as rightly said this of course at the colloquium we are trying to make sure there is a start on these very interesting topics uh, uh, doing around in uh, in cooperative research and education mm -hmm. so thank you once again uh, dr sitsel and dr ingrid uh, and of course the griffith center for systems innovation uh, this was uh, wonderful, uh, our first interaction, of course, uh, on this very topic, and uh, we look forward to being in touch and building upon uh, these issues. Uh, maybe before we all depart, uh, if, if you could uh, switch on your camera and uh, for a quick photo to uh, record this uh, colloquium and, of course, the last one uh, for this year. Uh, so that will be very useful to help us document and, of course, circulate the recordings to others who could not join. So just waiting for a few more. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Once again, uh, we, of course, will continue the co-op colloquium series and uh, we'll, we'll be back with the ninth iteration uh, and the first one for next year in February. Uh, with collaborating with the Cooperative Institute in Malaysia on a very interesting topic uh, they'd like to discuss. So we'll come back to you with more, uh, more information on that. And in the meantime, of course, uh, season's greetings. Uh, have a Merry Christmas and uh, Happy Holidays. And we look forward to seeing you uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.